self-service virtual environments based on OpenStack at Deutsche Telekom. For those of you, you uh, who attended just uh, the keynote from Mark Shuttleworth, uh, to, to avoid any confusion, we are not the part of Deutsche Telekom that he was mentioning. We are using Ubuntu, but uh, we are only working uh, in a small and internal environment. So what I'm going to talk about is a uh, short history of our project. Uh, we're calling it Volk 7, which is uh, a, a, German, a German term. Volk is, is the translation of the English cloud. And when we say Volk 7, uh, it's basically what, what uh, is uh, Cloud 9 in, in English. So a uh, few words of my, to me. I'm Alex Scherberg, 43 years old. And I started to work for Deutsche Telekom back in 2001. And for three and a half years now, I'm working as a cloud architect. And um, I'm working with OpenStack since the uh, Diablo release. So uh, in the end of 2011, there was an organizational change in Deutsche Telekom. And we've been formed as a team called Infrastructure Design. And we started to look at automation technologies, Puppet, Chef, and um, also infrastructure tools like, like OpenStack. And um, about a year later, we had uh, found two basic use cases. So the first one is plain infrastructure as a service. We wanted to provide virtual machines to internal customers for their testing purposes uh, to, to just to be able to have machines quickly get up, get up things running in a, in a very high and fast pace. And the other use case we had were managed environments, uh, kind of platform as a service. So um, we've set up a complete CI CD environment. I'm coming, coming to that later. Both use cases were served from one cloud environment. So we have one OpenStack installation, and part of it is provided as plain infrastructure as a service. And everything that is running in, in, in the past environment is, is coming from one specific tenant. So as I said, we are serving only internal customers. So we have no public offering that is uh, available to, to uh, end customers. And um, in the initial design phase, we had two basic principles that we, that we committed. The first one was we wanted to stay open source, so no proprietary software, and um, open standards, open source. And the other one was we wanted to build our own thing and not get in any, any partners to help us deploy and set up. The... So um, a few words on the infrastructure we're running. We're running on super microservice. Um, basically, two, two models. Uh, the first is the um, 2U Twin, which is a two-unit machine compri compromised of uh, four single servers. That's uh, what we're using for compute nodes and for basic infrastructure. And for storage purposes, we use plain 2U 12-disk machines. Everything is running on uh, Ubuntu Precise because we needed the long-time support version. And um, we're currently looking into uh, migrating to uh, TAR. But um, we're, not, we're not sure when, when this will happen. Uh, we're using upstream Ubuntu, uh, OpenStack packages from the Ubuntu Cloud Archive. So we have no internal development for, for our own packages. We're just using the upstream. The same goes uh, for our storage. We're using Ceph packages from, from the Ink Tank repository. And for the bare metal deployment, we're using FAI. I don't know if, if anyone of, of, of you knows this. Uh, it has been initiated at the University of Cologne. And it basically is a Pixie boot server that, that sets up your, your, your hardware. And um, it goes up to the point where the machine is able to talk to our Puppet master. And the rest of the deployment is done with Puppet. And we're monitoring all this with Nagios and uh, the CheckMK plugin. So just to give you an idea of uh, the size of our environment, it's really uh, cute. We're running 12 compute nodes with uh, two six-core Intel processors each. And we are running three storage nodes that make up about 60 terabyte of, of net capacity. Um, Cisco switches for, for the 10GE network and also for one, one gig for, for administration. So uh, 
when we came into planning and then set up of, of the environment, um, first thing we realized was that setting up OpenStack is quite painless. There are very good official docs available, and um, it's very easy to, to get OpenStack up and running if you, if you follow these docs. But uh, we needed a bit more. We needed to set up a complete data center. So we had to find a location for it. We needed connectivity, some basic infrastructure services like DNS, mail, proxy, and of course, all the automation stuff around it, which is our install server and Puppet and uh, monitoring and so on. So this was a little bit uh, complex setup. Another thing uh, is we have some interesting security requirements that force us to deviate from, from the official docs that are very basic in, in terms of networking segregation. And there we had, we had to, to implement many more networks, many more VLANs, and separate the administration from the storage, from monitoring, and so on. And um, what took us the most time was the adoption of the Puppet modules that we took from uh, Puppet Labs to, to make them work and install OpenStack the way we needed it. So um, that gave us the, the uh, ability to provide infrastructure as a service via simple Horizon dashboard, which was a little bit uh, adapted to our needs. Uh, the most notable extension was integration of OpenID for authentication. This is also a security requirement at Deutsche Telekom that uh, systems must use a two-factor authentication. So um, we just took an, an internal platform that was able to provide two-factor auth and um, attached it to, to Keystone, which was pretty easy. So. Um, we had the ability to give customers self-service virtual machines the way they needed it. And um, the next step was set up virtual private environments. That was our idea of giving customers the ability to have not only a virtual machine deployed with a, with a simple mouse click, but a complete LAMP stack or a web server, a Tomcat installation, whatever. First thing we did was we took um, a few simple cloud init scripts, published them on our internal website for to see Apache, MySQL, or Tomcat. So uh, if a user starts a machine, he can simply copy that script, paste it over into the dashboard, into the user data field, and a few minutes later, he's up with a LAMP stack or with a MySQL install, whatever. So this is still full self-service all the control of the machine and the responsibility for complying to security restrictions is in the hand of our user, our customer. But um, by providing it with these scripts, uh, we can assure that users, if, if they follow our scripts, they are compliant with our internal security. So this is an example script that simply sets up, uh, as it said here, oh, sorry. It's, a, it's an Apache worker, so basically there are two packages installed, and then we, we disable some modules and make some adjustions to Apache configuration to meet our security compliance. Um, then the next step was that we decided we want to provide a complete CI, CD environment for Java development because that's the main language used in our, in our part of Deutsche Telekom. So um, we've set up a mixture of a Git repository, Jenkins server, and a Tomcat application server with an Apache, uh, so that the user simply checks in his code in, into a Git repository and then goes via a post hook to, uh, to the Jenkins and is checked for errors and if everything went well, it is simply deployed to the Tomcat as a, as a jar file. So uh, the users don't have to carry about machines or, or scaling. This is fully managed by our test and development team. Um, the environment is set up with a combination of Bash and Python Boto scripts. So uh, this is not yet fully integrated in, into the dashboard but it's, it's a process where you order it via email and um, maybe there has to be a confirmation by the manager. And, but we are still very fast because uh, 
the pure deployment only takes only takes half an hour. So um, maybe it takes a day if, if, if you don't get the approval within an hour or two, but we're still way faster than before where we had to wait three weeks or four weeks simply for the machines to be deployed, not mentioning the software running on it. So that's, uh, let me just get back. Um, that's what we've been running since March of uh, 2013. So um, this is still using Nova Network, so the customers had no way to say uh, we need uh, a segregation between front end machines and let's say back end or application service databases. And um, but there was many, many, much, much uh, demand for Neutron on, on one side, software-defined networking. On the other hand, um, this environment is only reachable from our corporate internet, intranet. So um, it's very well suited for application development, testing, and so on. But there was no way to make those machines publicly reachable from the internet because the, the networks are, are completely separated. So we decided we need another environment with uh, internet connectivity that is then not reachable from corporate intranet, only, only via proxy and from the outside. And um, as we had some different requirements, so uh, for example, we, need, we need, did not need uh, these, these development environments, we started again with a plain infrastructure as a service setup. And we started this in the end of mid-2013. Of mid so um, we have moved to a new location because where we had our first environment running, there was no, uh, not enough internet bandwidth available, so we needed to move to a new data center provider. And um, again, that means uh, we needed to set up a complete data center with all the services around it because we, the only thing we got from our provider was two racks, power, cooling, and um, two network cables for, for the internet upstream. So this took us uh, around five, six months until uh, we were ready, so ready for production. We had end of April, start of May, just a few weeks ago. And currently, we're looking for a dedicated operations team because what we've seen is that we are pretty well able to, to develop the environments, to, to set them up, to get them running, but we are not the guys to, to make 24-7 operations. So uh, there have been some negotiations last week with uh, colleagues inside Deutsche Telekom, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not yet informed how, how was the outcome of that. Um, as we switched to the newer version of OpenStack, we're running Havana there. Uh, we have heat installed, and it's usable by customers, so they can use their own heat templates to install complex application stacks. But we are not yet able to port over the old Bash and Python scripts that we had to deploy our, our CI environment to, to, the new, to the new platform. So um, going from Folsom to, to Havana and from Nova Network to Neutron brought a few infrastructure changes that were sometimes difficult to, to master. The first one is um, there's no more dedicated network nodes, so uh, we have all the DHCP and L3 agent distributed amongst our compute nodes. So um, we're trying to, to balance system utilization by having them provide compute power on, on, on one side and the networking functionality on the other side. There is one central neutron server that does all the scheduling part, and so, but the, the, the packet transportation packet switching is done inside the compute nodes. This is not very well supported in Havana yet, so uh, we had to write a few Python scripts that monitor the availability of our agents that check if they are responding, if they are available, and if anything goes wrong, they, they just take the agent and reschedule it to, to another machine so that it stays up. And um, this works, 
but uh, we have no long time experience. As I said, we just started in, in, in the end of April with deploying this. Uh, hopefully, there will be better ways to handle this in, in Juno, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that, that it does. There are some interesting blueprints. So uh, what we currently do is looking uh, into Icehouse, but um, we had the idea to, to just take the Havana environment and migrate it to Icehouse because there are no structural changes between, between the two releases that would have uh, made trouble for us. But a major issue for us actually is the operating system. So um, as I mentioned, we are running Ubuntu 12.04, and um, there are no packages available from, from the Icehouse release for, for, this, for this version. So migrating from Havana to Icehouse, which should be pretty easy, um, in the same time means for us that we have to migrate from Ubuntu 12.04 to 14.04 which is something we, we have not yet uh, been able to because this has, has to be tested and maybe we're going to, to do this in, in the next few weeks. So um, new environment brings, brings some new hardware, but there are no, no real changes. We've changed the switch vendor from, from Cisco to Alcatel Lucent. And, um, the only thing is that we've blown up our storage capacity to uh, more than 300 terabyte net, which still is quite cute, I, I, I know. So um, what we have learned from, from all this in, in, our, in our journey with OpenStack, um, the first uh, slide lists some technical points we've seen. Infrastructure deployment is really a tough thing, if, even if you start on a green field where you we simply have enough power cooling and, and an internet upstream cable. So um, there are many, many things you have to care about and um, there's no real good documentation available for, for, for this in its, in its whole complexity. So you have to take a piece here, a piece there, a piece there, which was very hard because we decided we're doing all of this for ourselves. but. Um, in the end, it was a lot of fun, and then we all learned uh, quite a lot. The next thing is that if you deploy OpenStack and you are not able to fix the code in case there's any, there's any bug you're running into, that makes the thing very, very difficult and sometimes really frustrating because you know there is a bug fix, it's available, but it's not available for Folsom. It's available in, in, in Grizzly, and there is an existing backport, but that had never made it into the official packages. So um, as we are a team without real development power, so we are all infrastructure guys, we are, we are system guys, and um, we did not want to, to, to provide our own packages and simply rely on upstream. That was sometimes very hard. And in the end, with our new environment, we have started to patch the packages where we need them, which is nothing we are, we are doing with passion, but it simply it had to be done. And the old environment has some tiny bugs where we, we need how to, how to get around them, but sometimes they hit us. and. Uh, then we, we, we are really in, in trouble. Uh, one example is a suspended machine that lives on a hypervisor that is rebooted is gone afterwards. So you can't, you can't delete it, you can't, you can't unsuspend it. And um, we have found out that it is possible uh, with resetting the state to active and doing a hard reboot, which was mentioned uh, uh, yesterday in, in, in one of the talks I was in that might fix it, but it didn't work all the time. So we have, in fact, lost some machines due to unexpected hypervisor reboots just because there was, there was no way to, to resurrect them. It, 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 it has something to do with Nova network and bridges and VLANs not recreated properly if you, if you unsuspend the machine. And um, in the new environment, we find out that HA for Neutron is a very complex beast, as I, as I already mentioned. It's not really working in Havana. There are some steps in, in, in the right direction. And um, as I said, I hope that uh, Juno will bring us uh, relief here. 
And last thing from, from the technical side of view, deploying multi-tire applications without heat is no, is no fun. This is, this is difficult because you have to, to care very much for, for synchronization. So uh, start your web server and um, connect it to the database and the database is not yet deployed. So uh, it all breaks or you, you, you just, just start to uh, create your database without the engine running. So you have to take all the, all the uh, dependencies in, into, into considerations and, and have to care yourself for it. Um, we've had some tests with heat that look very, very promising simply, simply in that area. Um, the next slide is some organizational lessons we've learned where we seen kind of problems arise. The first thing is we need a really proper internal stakeholder management to, to ensure proper funding because uh, we've seen the problem that we're providing a platform that enables other units inside Deutsche Telekom to do uh, less cost intensive production and but the unit that does the investment for, for providing the platform is not the unit that finally gets the cost savings. So uh, you have to, to, to take all stakeholders in, into one room and, and get them to, to agree on, on, on the project and on the funding because um, it sometimes causes interesting effects in, in large enterprises. Um, another fact is many customers don't know the difference between virtualization and cloud computing. Uh, we've seen many, many cases where customers came over and said, hey, you have a platform that's really cheap and we would like to use it and get our machines on it. How about running a rack cluster on it? So um, they have their legacy application, Oracle rack cluster or whatever, which relies on the availability of one single database instance all over the time or simply is not able to, to switch to another application server if one is not responding. So it's simply, it's, it's not stateless, it's not cloud aware. And they come to you and say, hey, I have this, we need to run it on, on your platform, make it go. And um, then you're trying to argue that it's not possible, that you must redesign the application at least make some make some assumptions that that may not be present in, in the legacy code and then only thing you hear is we have no time we have no money for for a redesign or for adoption of, of, of uh, our application make it run sometimes this is even enforced by by management so uh, that really gets you into trouble and in the end you end up with an infrastructure or an operations team that is not happy because it has to to handle lots of lots of pets instead of instead of using a cattle based approach and on the other hand you have a customer that is not happy because it's not running the way he he expects it to do um, that's closely tied to, to to the next point where um, you need a kind of change management because the switch to cloud computing touches 95% of your operations roles, at least. So uh, you, you simply can't take a few guys that have managed classic Unix service, Linux service clusters for, for some of our colleagues more than 15 years and get them into a cloud environment and say, hey, manage this. Because everything is, is completely different. You have no time to, to make week-long test cases for new releases, for, for new uh, bug fixes. And um, if, if you do, of, of course you can do in a cloud environment, but if you do, then you lose all the agility and the speed uh, advantage that, that you get from such a platform. And. Um, Last not least, we found out that um, for, for large and inhomogeneous teams, um, Scrum is not the right project management method. We, we've started out as a Scrum project with, I think, 14 people in the core team. And um, imagine you have, you have 14 guys in, in, in a 15-minute sprint and everyone 
just wants to to give a short statement what he has done, what he will do today, and what's m possibly blocking his work. So uh, it's it's simply not possible. And then the other point was that the spectrum of of uh, tasks we had to do was too too wide for for Scrum to really work because. Scrum kind of relies on everybody being able to do everything that, that's, that's coming up in the team. So it's really uh, a useful method for, for software development in teams with, I don't know, five, six, eight guys, but, but really not more. And only if every one of those guys is able to say, hey, you have problems, you're, you're not coming, getting on very well, let me aid you. So that was not possible if, if you have one guy that is responsible for infrastructure services like a mail and a proxy server, and on the other hand, you have some, some puppet ninjas, and um, there's no way they, they can help each other. So um, what we ended with was something, I say, Kanban-like, where we had our daily meetings, but uh, we, we had to, to kick Scrum because it didn't work very well for us. That's it from my side. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Uh, hello. Uh, hi. hi. My name is Charles Gay from Arista. So I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, the, is there any plan to use OpenStack for NFV in Deutsche Telekom? And second one is that, that you mentioned about that you uh, decided to change the switch vendor from Cisco to Arcaton Lucent due to the VXLAN capability. So are you actually using the hardware of VXLAN capability uh, of Arcaton Lucent in current OpenStack environment? Um, regarding the first questions, yes, there are plans to, to use NFV inside Deutsche Telekom, but um, not with products and innovation where I am working, but I have colleagues that are that are working on NFV projects uh, related to OpenStack. Um, second question is um, the, the the decision to switch from Cisco, or even further, the decision to use Cisco for the first environment was simply because there is a there is a large company agreement between Cisco and Deutsche Telekom and. Our networking folks have been working with Cisco switches for the last 10, 15 years, so they are kind of Cisco experts. And um, as we didn't have much time for hardware selection, and so we just decided to, to go with Cisco because we knew it, we knew that it might most probably do what we needed, and um, we decided to, to accept the slightly higher price. Uh, with the second environment, we had a, a bit more time for hardware, hardware selection, and um, so we did a bit of comparison regarding features and price, and finally ended up with Alcatel Lucent because there's a, there's a very attractive uh, company agreement with Deutsche Telekom as well. So uh, feature-wise, uh, we are not using many advanced features of the switches. We, are, we simply um, attach every machine with, with two links to, to one switch each, and they are, they are virtually stacked and speak LHCP, and that's it. So you are not actually using hardware fixed capability in your the OpenStack environment, right? Yeah. OK, got it. Other questions? Well, yeah. Hello, my name is John Brzezowski from Comcast. Um, we've taken note to, and, and have some collaborations with the folks who are doing the TerraStream project yeah. in Deutsche Telekom. So one of the questions I had for you is, um, I, did, I noticed that you're using a lot of the stuff that comes from, from Trunk, um, and I know that the work that we've done, and that we'll be talking about later, we talked about how we've implemented IPv6, and to the, to the comment earlier about NFV, we're looking to kind of couple those two spaces together. Yeah. I'm curious if you have any, any comments or anything you can say about you know, if, if you've gone down the path of V6, um, you know, or you know, or or not, you know, and if, if you have not yet, what are your what are your thoughts moving forward? Well, for our environment, um, IPv6 would be nice, but we can live without it just for the time being. Uh, regarding the TerraStream project, with us again another unit inside Deutsche Telekom. Um, 
they have the decision to go IPv6 only. So for them, there was no option to say, okay, we just say with IPv4 because IPv6 in OpenStack will come in, in, in one of the next releases, hopefully. And um, for us, we are, we are pretty fine with, with IPv4 right now. Right. Are they are they sharing? You know, since, since Deutsche Telekom is kind of the overall parent company, yeah. are they doing their own kind of OpenStack cloud infrastructure, or are they also piggybacking on your work as well? Uh, it's very difficult in, in inside inside Deutsche Telekom. Um, we are running our own environments, each, each, each for the, of the units, and um, there is of course a lot of informal collaboration, but. Uh, if you go up three or four management uh, layers and uh, then have to go down to, to reach the other guys, formally, it's, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah, my company's quite large as well. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Yes, uh, I am Jin Cho Kim from SK Telecom Korea. I have two questions on your presentation. Uh, I'm wondering what the most hard pain points in the migration from Habana to ISA uh, I think I, I saw that you're using Ubuntu uh, operating system, Linux system, uh, for your OpenStack platform. And I think, I, as far as I know, Ubuntu is supporting bare metal provisioning of nodes with Mars and Juju. Uh, are they in a, uh, aren't they enough for your migration use case? Or is there any other hard problems in your migration? Yeah, the, the problem, as I mentioned, is um, we needed to migrate the operating system first before we could m migrate OpenStack from Havana to ISOS. Yes. Um, we simply have not tested it, but we have had the, the experience that with our deployment method, every time we're, we're having a new software component or new hardware components in, in our environment, it takes us maybe a few weeks, but maybe three or four months to, to get it all running up again. So maybe it might have been easier if we had chosen Mars and Juju in, in the earlier stages, but at the moment uh, there are no plans to, to change the deployment method it's, itself because we have some experts that have been working with the tools for, for uh, almost three years now, and they are not very happy to Adopting new tools. Yeah, to adopting new tools and say, well, no, no not again. So um, actually, we're going to stay with Phi. And um, I think we, we, we need to test the, I don't expect um, great showstoppers simply from migrating to, to Havana to ISO. That should be quite seamless. But uh, our problem at the moment is, is the migration of, of the basic operating system. Okay, I see. Uh, and my second question is about your product management uh, method. Uh, how many people are involved in your project team for uh, the virtual environment uh, project? You, you mentioned 14 people were in your core team, is it correct? Yes. Um, okay. And other, any other people involved in the project? Yeah, there are, I don't know, six, seven, eight guys involved, but not full-time. So they are, they are uh, partly involved in certain tasks, for example, uh, the, the setup of, of the scripts for providing those virtual environments um, yes. was done by, by, by some people from our test and development yes. department. And um, Currently, they're, they're just managing the order, so they are not involved in further de development of, of our platform. I think there might be some, some differences of our, uh, be between our cases and your cases to adapting and applying the Scrum to your product management. Yeah. I'm leading a team uh, consisting of 30 people uh, on, my, on, on our OpenStack-based cloud management platform project, and Scrum is working very well in our case. Okay. So and I think uh, there might be some, some other issues in your team using Scrum. Maybe some, some, some of your, uh, your members may, may not, may not, uh, may not uh, like Scrum itself, maybe. It's some, some resist to adopting the method in some sense. However, anyway, uh, in, uh, in some sense, uh, you're right on that uh, the pure Scrum method is appropriate for a small project team, 
uh, with some with, with an assumption of some all of the members of the uh, project knows well about the nature of the project yeah. in itself. However, uh, if we are, I, I think uh, from my experience, I think I believe that uh, Scrum uh, might be the might be working very well uh, uh, for projects such as. Uh, adopting off source uh, infrastructure softwares like OpenStack because open source, uh, open source softwares are, are, are very, uh, it's uh, it, it, it changing very frequently. So, in order to adapt those changes to, the, to your software development project, uh, Scrum may be the, um, one of the right solutions for the project management. Uh, from yeah. my experiences, I think what we what we ended with for for our project management also was was kind of an agile method, uh, yes. even if if I can't name it right now, because it was it had some parts of Scrum, some parts of Kanban, some parts of classical waterfall management. Yes. Uh, but what I think we've still been working in an agile way, so. Um, it was the formal Scrum processes that didn't fit very well. Maybe it was it was issues with with our teams where we had some specialists that have been working ten years, twenty years in in, in classical methods and were not not able to to do that transition very well. Maybe we should have a coffee on this. Yes. Yes. Th <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Gleister. I'm with the National Institutes of Health in uh, Maryland. Um, my question is about the developer or re responsibility for the instances. You mentioned that developers in your organization are responsible for the, the, the security policy compliance. Yeah. How does that play out? Because our developers, well, uh, some developers could care less about security. That's not that their focus is on making great apps. Yeah, that, that is an issue. Um, the point is, at the moment where you go with your machine to, to a greater audience than, than simply a four or six people development team, then you have to be fully compliant with the security uh, rules. Um, as long as only a few people have access to the machine, it's not, it's not really important, but if you do not comply uh, in, 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 in the development cycle, then it's very, very difficult to get things done right uh, at the moment you, you go out. But it, it is an issue, and we, we sometimes have, let's say, or problems with, with this, but um, in the end, it, it turns out to, to work pretty well. So who's res once an application goes to production and is forward facing on the internet, who is responsible for for the uh, uh, you know making sure those those instances are patched and, and comply? Is it still the, the developer? You no, know, that's that's an operation issue then. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? I think I think we're running out of time. So well, that's it. Thank you for coming and enjoy the summit.